Good day to you, dear friends. Today we are looking at the New Testament lessons for the fourth Sunday of Lent in year B of the Common uh, Revised Lectionary. And uh, I would ask you to take a look first at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and then later we will look at St. John the Divine's uh, Gospel lesson which uh, is uh, the third chapter, the 14th through the 21st verses. So let's move uh, directly to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians is a, a letter uh, that is disputed. Many people believe that Paul wrote it. Uh, some people think that uh, some disciples of Paul wrote it. No one can really prove, in fact, that Paul wrote Ephesians. And uh, Colossians is kind of in the same boat with Ephesians. One of the reasons that scholars that spend a whole lifetime studying Paul and Paul's epistles or his letters is that one of the things that stands out in Greek in the uh, letter to the church at Ephesus or Ephesians is that the sentences are so long. They end up uh, being 50, 60 words long. And typically uh, Paul's uh, letters that are his beyond dispute, like Romans or Corinthians or Galatians or Philippians or Philemon, for example, uh, First Thessalonians also falls into that group, is that Paul's letters, the sentences are usually 17 to 22 words, something in there. And uh, Ephesians, the sentences are so long. I believe, if my memory serves me, that in the first chapter of Ephesians, the whole chapter is uh, maybe two or three sentences long with the second sentence being just uh, takes up almost the whole chapter. So that's not really important. What's important is the theology that is being imparted by this writer, whether it's Paul, whether it's his disciples, or whether Paul wrote this originally and then his disciples came back and edited it, uh, and when I talk about the disciples, I, I mean Paul's disciples, people that traveled around with him like Barnabas and uh, Cyrus and Lydia and uh, people such as that. So whoever the writer is, he begins by saying, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. And when he says they're dead, he doesn't mean uh, necessarily in a uh, literal way, what he really means is you are spiritually dead inside because of the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Uh, interestingly enough, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, we have the word trespasses. Methodists usually use that. And uh, we have debts that's used by Presbyterians. And here is also the word sin. They're all virtually synonymous. They all mean where people have fallen short of the glory of God, where people have missed the mark. They, they aim at the good, but they don't hit the good. And so that's what he means by talking about uh, you were dead through trespasses and sins in which you once lived. And now he's talking about that in the past tense. So he's given them the opportunity to raise their hand and say, yes, I, I live uh, in a better way than I used to, in which I used to live in sin and trespass. Following the course of this world. When he says following the course of this world, what he means is you people are just like Gentiles. And uh, we have to understand here that in the early church, there were Jewish Christians and there were Gentiles. Christians. The Jewish Christians usually followed the ritual law, the Hebrew law, and tried to live as Christians. 
the Gentiles had no idea what any of that meant. And so when he says uh, the course of this world, what he's really doing, the writer that is, is telling these people that they used to follow uh, just the course of the secular culture in which they, they lived. And then he says, following the ruler of power of the air, which is a kind of a, a strange and mystical way to talk about the power that uh, secular culture exerts on people that live within it. The spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. So if you do not follow the law, if you're disobedient to the uh, rule of Christ, which basically means the rule of love, then uh, you are grouped with uh, these people who are dead through their trespasses and their sins. Uh, then he goes on to say, that is the writer, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh. In other words, when uh, someone lives in this way contrary to the dictates of, and commandments uh, of God, the ordinances that God gives to people, then uh, they end up following the passions of the flesh. Now, the passions of the flesh can mean all kinds of things. Typically, in our culture, passions of the flesh just basically mean sex. That's uh, the automatic uh, default position that most people think about. But, but there's a whole lot more to it. Uh, the passions of the flesh are to respond to jealous feelings, for example, or to uh, respond to uh, the God of the belly, as Paul will write in another place in his letters, that uh, we worship food, or those who are caught up with alcohol or tobacco, or those who want to best their neighbor uh, because they're so competitive that they have to be on top. All of those things are sort of what we could call passions of the flesh, where we are in competition with others and we want to win out. Uh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Child of wrath is someone who lets his or her emotions get the best of them. You lose your temper and you say things you know you shouldn't say. And there is always a price for human beings that lose control. Uh, no matter what kind of control it is, we, there are consequences to be paid when one loses control and one becomes a child of, say, wrath like everyone else. And then we have what's called the biblical but. There's a reversal here, and it says, but God who is rich in mercy. And that's good news for these people that have been described to this point in this lesson. Uh, God, who is rich in mercy out of a great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. God could have held us to account like he did the Hebrews in our lesson that we had earlier in the week from Numbers but God is rich in mercy and he makes us alive together with Christ. And then we have one of two places where we have this very, um, I guess you would say, well-known sort of summary of the Christian faith, uh, the summary of what God has done for us in Christ. It says, and it's set off here um, by uh, these uh, dashes uh, or hyphens even in our text it says by grace you have been saved by God's mercy you have received salvation by God's great love you are healthy and whole and well again as a human being that's what all those uh, the, all those phrases mean by grace you have been saved and raised up with us in him and seated us with him in the heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. Uh, in other words, after we are saved, we sit with Christ Jesus in his very presence so that in the ages to come, he might show us immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And so God puts us with Christ Jesus as a way to demonstrate wholeness or wellness or being made uh, completely human in Jesus Christ. It's, uh, it's uh, a way of saying that we are saved. And then again, we see this phrase, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. In other words, our salvation in Jesus Christ that God gives us in grace, we receive in faith. We receive it uh, with, with trust. We trust this promise that God gives us in Christ. And this is not your own doing. In other words, he's reminding people that you cannot save yourself. Only God can save you. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. No one can say, see what I did, I saved myself. That is off the table, it cannot happen. For we are what he has made us, and this is what it is. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. In other words, we are saved for a reason. We're not saved just because we happen to be uh, from a well-known family or that we have great wealth or we're the right nationality. We speak the right kind of language. We have the right kind of education. No, all this is what God has done for us and so that we can do the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us. God has saved us to be servants uh, of other people. In other words, this is what this text is saying. Now we come to the gospel uh, according to John, and we're in the third chapter, and this is what I call the Nicodemus chapter, and the reason I call it that is this is where we find Nicodemus first in the gospel. Later on, at the end of John, we will find Nicodemus uh, together with Joseph of Arimathea taking care of Jesus' body and so forth. But here, this is a Jewish leader. Uh, one could say one of the Jewish authorities, probably in the Sanhedrin. He uh, comes to Jesus by night because he's heard so many things about Jesus and he wants to ask him questions. It's perfectly natural and uh, it makes sense. And so here we break into the middle of chapter three and in this chapter, uh, beginning with verse 14, we see an allusion to the story in the wilderness that it was told to us in our last session from the book of Numbers, the one about the snakes biting the Hebrew people and uh, they, they, uh, they begin to die. And then there is a serpent that is instructed by Yahweh to Moses to stick on a, a bronze staff or pole and held up. And if the people are bitten by a serpent and they look at the snake or the serpent on the pole, they will be saved or they will not die. And uh, so the very first uh, verse of our lesson for today, John 3, 14, comes as an allusion to that particular story in Numbers. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now this is Jesus speaking but he is speaking about himself. He calls himself the son of man, which is a messianic title, which is similar to the Christ or the one sent by God or uh, whatever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who so believes in him may not perish, 
but have eternal life. That is perhaps the most famous verse in all of our 66 books of the Bible. For God so loved the world, or that word world can be translated cosmos. Uh, and whoever uh, loves in this particular way will not perish, but if you believe in this cosmic Christ, then you will have eternal life. And uh, this phrase, eternal life, John uses in the same way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke use uh, the two uh, synonymous terms, basically, uh, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. And uh, this is an important point because so many people understand God as being full of condemnation and judgment. And here John very explicitly, very clearly says that uh, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, might be made well or whole or complete in and through him. In other words, Jesus is the vehicle that brings God's salvation to human beings. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Okay, hear that. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so the way that the Gospel of John puts it is everything depends on somebody's relationship or belief or trust in Christ who is the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Here comes the judgment. That the light has come into the world. Jesus is the light. We will see this in several other places in, uh, in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is the light of the world. And people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In other words, when we do things we ought not to do, we don't do them out for everybody to see. We do them in a way that they are, are hidden or in the shadows or in the darkness. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. I mean, this is not brain surgery. This is a, a truth about life. Uh, we always look to see who's watching us and when and where and why, and we don't want to expose the things that we are either embarrassed about or ashamed about. But those who do uh, what is true come to the light. In other words, if you're going to do something generous, or you're going to do something that is a, a good, then you do it and you're not embarrassed if other people see it or not. Now, you don't do it just to draw attention to it, but you're not embarrassed by doing the good and you can do that in the light so that uh, it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. In other words, if your deeds are exposed to the light and they're found to be good, then they are deeds that God himself has, has given to you. So I'd like to thank you for being with us for our Bible study today in the New Testament lessons for the fourth Sunday of Lent in year B. We're moving closer and closer to the glorious time of Easter. And I pray that uh, during this penitential season uh, of Lent, when we pray and meditate, study the Bible, practice the uh, spiritual disciplines, that it might prepare us for Holy Week and then prepare us for uh, Jesus' glorious resurrection on Easter morning. Thank you for being with us. I look forward to seeing you next week.